Grace, peace, and mercy to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, this morning, I want you to use your uh, imagination, actually more so than your imagination, your memory. And I want you to uh, think back, remember a time uh, that you were filled with awe and wonder. It's kind of a hard thing. Um, I like the word. The word awe is a, is a really good word, um, but I don't know that we really... Um, Maybe I should remind you of the meaning of it, because we might, we're the, we're, we might use the word awesome, um, but I don't know that we really understand the word awesome. Uh, we could use the word awesome to describe a, a great car or a pizza, um, but, but the idea of awe. Here, here's the definition. So, a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear or wonder. A feeling of reverential respect filled, uh, mixed with, with fear or wonder. Now, I want you to think back uh, in your memory. Think back to a time where you were filled with awe at something that was happening before you. And maybe the example might be uh, um, husbands, that moment when you saw your bride the first time on your wedding day. There's fear. There's wonder. There's this reverential uh, feeling that fills your heart, right? This, this amazing uh, feeling. Or, or, or wives, ladies, maybe it's the first time you saw your husband. Or maybe it's when you saw your child being born or you held your baby for the very first time. Uh, or maybe even things in nature that would fill you with awe, like you saw the ocean for the first time or you saw uh, the Rocky Mountains for the first time off in the distance. And, and it, felt, it, it filled you. With a, with a feeling of awe and wonder. Now, the challenge of that, um, and this is all human nature, right? This is, this is human nature, this is how we work, is that um, that sense of awe disappears. It, it doesn't repeat itself over and over again, right? You uh, married couples, you see your wife and your husband every day. You don't have that same feeling of awe. You see your kids and, and that feeling that you had when you held your child for the first time, now they're two, um, or they're 13. And uh, that feeling, that sense of awe has maybe, um, it, it's, it's far in your memory, right? Or, or maybe it's that, even that, that sense of seeing nature, seeing God's creation, and that beauty that you've now seen many times, all with its you know, pollution and everything, it doesn't fill you with that same sense of awe. And that's human nature. That's just kind of the way things go. Um, however, here's the challenge that we face today. And, and the challenge is it's real and it's true because what if that also describes our relationship with God? What if that describes your relationship with God? That, that uh, years ago, maybe for the first time, and you opened up scripture or somebody had a conversation with you or, or you saw a, a, a cross and somebody explained to you and you recognized maybe for the very first time that this God of all creation, this, this Christ that came to live in this world, died for you. And it filled you with a sense of awe and wonder. It was an amazing kind of picture. And, uh, and, and now, you know, years have gone by. You open up the Bible and, well, it doesn't fill you with awe anymore. Maybe you're, maybe you're kind of filled with boredom having trouble keeping your eyes open or, or even pulling his word off the shelf or, or maybe over a period of time you have uh, come to worship and, and maybe the first time you came to worship or maybe early on in your life of faith you came into a place and I'm not talking about a nice feeling right I'm, I'm talking about a, a responsible even factual sense of awe but now now the kids are crying or You've lost the Cheerio container, or um, there's just not that sense anymore. How do we, see this is important, um, this is valuable, this is something we read about in scripture that, that God over and over reminds us that we can see him with a sense of awe on an ongoing basis, that we would see God even with uh, being filled with a sense of wonder, uh, a reverential respect for what God has done and, and what he continues to do. We don't need to lo lose that. But what's the, uh, how do we get it back? How, how does it become a part of our daily walk with Jesus? 
Uh, I, I want to I have, well, we've been looking at the Gospel of Mark for a number of weeks now. I'm going to continue to look at this, this reading that we have before us today. Um, but before I do, I, I want to describe to you a, a process, maybe even a, a, a routine that has been present all through Scripture. And it's present in our reading today. And it includes a response of awe and wonder. Uh, but it's a, it's a routine that we, uh, even a process that we have recognized in Scripture for many, many years. You can open up the Scriptures and you can see this process happening. It's not complex. It's not confusing. It's one you already know, but let me point it out. Um, uh, last week's reading is probably a good example. Uh, Chris shared a message with us and we, we were focused upon a reading that's probably familiar to some of you, many of you. And it's the feeding of the 5,000. In that reading, this process is present process goes like this. Part number one, step number one, there is a separation between God and his people. Something is separating them. In the reading from last week, we even see the disciples are inviting a separation. They say, Jesus, send those people away. Right? They're, it's getting late. Uh, they're hungry. There's no food. Send them away. There's a separation. That's kind of number one. Uh, number two, is there is a calling out to God for help, uh, even a crying out to God for help. Heal me, help me, comfort me. God, I need you. Last week we saw that. There was a need, right? The people were hungry. Now they're being, uh, uh, the food is being talked about. Um, Jesus is having a conversation with, the, with his disciples and, and he's telling them, you feed them. And they're looking like, what do we do? Right? They're calling out to God to help them. Part number three, and this is the one that we always remember. It's the one that tends to be the focus of our readings, and it's that God comes in power, and he heals, or he helps. He displays his power. Last week we saw that. He displayed his power by taking five loaves and two fish and multiplying it and feeding thousands. And then there's this last part. The people are filled with a sense of awe and wonder. They, they bow down before him. They, they, they follow him. Now, we also know, you know this routine, right? We've read it a million times. Um, you know this routine. You know this process. You also know that some are filled with a sense of awe and some not so much. Some can look at uh, this, this great power of God, this healing of Christ, and actually question it, uh, kind of overlook it, Maybe even plot against him. So a sense of awe or a sense of who knows, right? Who knows what's happening? Now, now this process is one that continues. Um, let me just go back in scripture just a minute and uh, just briefly and, and just remind you how consistent this process is. Um, way back at the very beginning, Old Testament times, the people of God, they're held in bondage and slavery. And uh, there's a separation between God, right? God and his people. Uh, they are not in the promised land. They are held up. People would recognize and know that they are separated from God in some way. And they cry out to God for help. They say, God, save us, rescue us, free us. And then God comes in power. And remember what he did? He parted the sea. He came and displayed his mighty power as he parted the sea and allowed them to walk through on dry ground and escape from their enemies. And you know what the people did? They responded in awe and wonder at this, this magnificent God who would save us. And over and over again through the Old Testament, we see the people of God saying, remember what he's done, right? Remember that exodus. Remember what God is, has provided for us. God has, has saved us. And they'd remind each other over time. Now, some were filled with awe, no doubt, but we know that some, after a while, kind of forgot, Right? They, they forgot the name of the Lord their God is a refrain that we would hear. And, and then the process continued. And, and you know, here's another example of it, of it continuing. The people are then wandering in the wilderness and, um, and they're separated from God. Again, there's this separation because they're not yet in the promised land. And they cry out to God to help us. You have brought us out here only to starve us, God. Help us, feed us, comfort us. And this is where that step three comes in. God responds with a great power, a great miracle. He gave them bread from heaven, the manna that he would feed them with. And notice what God does here. It's just not one sign and wonder. It's, it, it, he's going to provide a miracle, a sign, a wonder. He's going to fill them with awe every single morning. 
They're going to get up and every morning there's going to be this uh, reminder that, that God provides. And people responded. In great awe and wonder, they would get up and they would see this magnificent display of God's provision as he fed them and cared for them, literally caring for them, feeding them. But you know how it goes if you've read this, right? You know that ah, eventually it really wasn't that awesome anymore. We want meat to eat, they said. Right? We want, want something more. Uh, God, show us your power, show us your might uh, again and again. So this process has continued. Uh, now, here's this process in our reading for today. We've been reading through the Gospel of Mark, and we come upon this uh, incredible miracle. And it's a display of, of Jesus walking on water. It's not a trick. It's not an apparition. He's not a ghost, right? Jesus, the God of all creation, has come into this world, and now he's displaying that he is truly God in a way that he wasn't healing anybody. Uh, he wasn't comforting, really, anybody by that, by that act. He could have done that. He could have appeared in the boat. But instead, he chose to display his command over nature, his command over the creation that he created, by the way. And, and I, I was reading this, um, what, about a week ago and preparing for today. And I got to admit that I, I followed this process, right? You would think I would open it up and I'd go, oh, how awesome. I get to preach on this miracle of Jesus walking on water. And, and I read it over and it's like, oh, and he walked on water and he got into the boat and calmed it. And it's like, yeah, yeah. It didn't fill me with any sense of awe and wonder. And, and, and I said to myself, which I'll say to you today, how do we, how do we continue to remind each other that, that God is God and that he does some amazing, magnificent, wonderful things, that he's created the world and he's also chose to come and even be with us today? So, so the result is this, right? The result is that if we, if we desire, not a good feeling, not to get all excited, right, not to stir up our emotions, but that if we would say that we need this, we need to be able to recognize who God is, even on a daily and continual basis. We need to, we need to remember every single day that the God of all creation, the God who walked on water, also chose to come into this world to take your sins upon himself, to die on a cross, to be crucified in your place, to rise from the grave to give you the promise of everlasting life, that you today, even as you sit here, you are ones who will be raised eternally. You are ones that will live forever in the presence of your God. Man, shouldn't that fill us with awe? But how does this work? How do we do that? Um, two things, two things that I think are important for us to keep in mind. Of course, of course, uh, well, the Bible talks about it. The Bible says that you, we, should not give up gathering together. And so we go to church. We go to worship. We come into the presence of God on a regular and routine basis, trying to keep it from becoming regular and routine. And we come and we gather together and we hear God's word read. Uh, we gather around his gifts. We sing his praise. And we hear once again this great reminder, this reminder that God is God. Right? And that he has saved you. And, and of course, that should fill us with that reminder as we look around, we, we see others, and we recognize that we should be filled with awe. We stand in his presence as we confess our sins, and we hear from one who's called to speak publicly, and, and we hear, you are forgiven because of Jesus. So is that it? Go to church, the pastor's saying. Right? Go to church, and you'll be filled with awe and wonder. And, uh, and that's not entirely true, is it? There's something that um, the Bible also speaks about that we tend to forget. And that is that we do this for one another. You're a, you're a priesthood of believers. You are uh, ones who have been claimed by God. And so, so you speak these words to one another. Let me give you practical examples. Uh, husbands, those that are married, husbands in this room. Um, it's your job. It is your job to look to your wife, especially in those times where she doesn't understand or remember this awe-inspiring God who would heal your marriage, 
Husbands, you look at your wife and you speak to her and you, you remind her that this is a big God and that God can heal us. Wives, it's your job. It's your, it's your job to look at your husband and remind him, especially on those times where maybe, maybe he's overwhelmed with fear and, and, and he's, he's forgotten this God. And wives, it's your job. Speak to your husband and remind him that, that he has a big God that can, that can comfort and guide and bless in any circumstances. Parents, it is your job to speak to your children. And tell those children, especially when they're at a time where they have kind of forgotten who this God is. Maybe it's just uh, uh, overwhelmed by their fear or difficulty. And you speak to your child, your children, and you say, no, no, you belong to an incredible God. A God who has saved you. A God who forgives you. A God who would allow you to overcome whatever you're facing. And, and children, it's your job. It's your job to speak to your parents and remind them, especially during difficult times, and remind them that they are a chosen, a beloved, redeemed child of God. No matter what difficulty they might be going through. And I could go on, right? Friend, friend, it is your job to speak to your friend. Especially when they're going through a difficult time and they've forgotten who it is that they belong to. And that you would remind them of this awe-inspiring God that has comforted, helped, healed, saved them. This is how we are daily reminded and filled with awe and wonder before God. This is what we do for one another. That we, uh, and, and this is how we do it, right? This, this is how we do it. We, um, we remind one another that the same God who walked on water, the same God who parted the sea and allowed uh, his people to walk through on dry ground is the same God who claimed us through waters of baptism. That by his word, he, he joined you to the life, death, and resurrection of his son, our savior, Jesus Christ. This God who would, uh, who would, who would claim us as his very own. Right? This is how we remind one another. We say, uh, uh, God, the same God who, who scattered and allowed uh, manna to appear before his people, who fed them who gave them daily provision, is the same God who lifted up bread before his Father in heaven and blessed it and fed thousands, is the very same God who, who provides bread and wine for you today, not just bread and wine. Because the same God who said, this is my body, this is my blood, is the very same God who is present in this meal for you today. This very same God who uh, arose from the grave to proclaim to the world that he has overcome sin and death is the very same God that proclaims to you today, your sins are forgiven. Who's the very same God. The very same God who not only rose from the grave but promised to come back and raise us from our graves is the very same God that on the last day will call you by name that you would be raised up to be with him in eternity. Let's remind one another of that. That we would not be filled with a great, uh, a great feeling or a warm fuzzy, right? But that daily, no matter what we're facing, no matter what uh, is happening in our home or with our children or with our life or our fear or our anxiousness or our marriage, whatever it might be, is that we would do that with one another. We'd gather together and, and we would come into the presence of a God who would fill us with awe and wonder. And we'd go out those doors and we would walk into our homes. We would spend time with our wives or our friends or our family members or, or our parents or children. And we would speak once again of this God who fills us with awe and wonder because he saved us. Amen. Amen. It's great to worship with you again today. We continue our worship this morning as we give our tithes and our offerings to the Lord that his work would continue to thrive here in this place. Amen.